just few things i want to just mention uh, before we get into it um sushil and i will be sort of uh, double teaming this um i don't have a second monitor and uh, you know it will be difficult for me to i hope my screen is visible to everybody but it will be difficult for me to do the um chat looking at the chat as well as flash my slides so sushil has gracefully accepted to um, do uh, to to help me out with the chat sessions um i let me with that let me just begin into uh, what i needed to talk about today uh, i'm sorry there is somebody at the door but there might be some rings please ignore that um so before we get into sec book of second samuel you know it, it probably is apt to look into what really transpired uh, in in first samuel i think there was a break uh, in between uh, where we finished off so still did finish off in second samuel for first samuel and then of course uh, you know there was a session from achan uh, really uh, you know which is apt for the current moment as well he um, he gave that session last week and now we are transitioning into this uh, second second book of samuel um some of the key points i have put it on this slide don't want to spend too much time but we start off for samuel with hannah's prayer um and essentially you know through her prayer uh, you know she gets uh, a newborn baby and that baby is samuel essentially is the last judge for israel as well as the first prophet uh, for israel uh there is an exchange between uh, her and eli as well eli is we, we figured out that eli is not doing what, what god has called him to do uh he is a high priest at the shilo but he is not able to maintain his house right his his children his kids essentially right hopeless and phineas they are bluff, blasphemous they are not just doing sin they're just doing sin in the holiest of holiest places right so this is where the ark of the covenant is kept in shallow and that's exactly where they are picking out the best of the offerings that people are bringing right and then also they're doing un- uh, things which are really bad in front of in the in the eyes of the lord and right in in, in that uh, holy or holy places he gets cursed in the meantime um, people of israel are also frustrated with all the defeats they are getting as well as you know they they know that eli's sons if they become the judge it's not going to be good for them because they are not righteous they are not doing things right in the god's eyes so they ask for a king right and really you know this reminded me of of one of those thing you know one of the sayings from cs lewis um he says he is a big uh, you know he is a christian apologist but more 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 he's more known for being a novelist and he is a author and all right he says there are only two kinds of people in this world one says to the lord thy will be done and to the other the god says thy will be done right so this is precisely that scenario where the people of israel who are supposed to be under god's law were supposed to be under god's love for that matter right is asking for a human king right so see, we see that transition from having you know um, governed by judges and then we see that cyclic way within whole of judges where they do, doing good they are near to god judges are keeping it all together and they they do sin and they are, they are then defeated by all of their enemies all around them right israelites they suffer they cry out new judge so you will see that pattern continue where god who is so much loving he is continuously giving opportunities right so his aim which really started with the promise to abraham was to create this nation right under him under god this we read in genesis um, so that is so he is essentially taking us through right not only that it's a promised land physical land which was promised more of on a spiritual level salvation right and that which leads to us to back to jesus so that's the continuum you have to keep in mind right it's is the promise which has been kept right and so that's really the theme um, you know for first samuel right um as we go on as well right uh, we see based upon the request from uh, the people samuel is put as the anointed king of israel people get their wish right so god did say that be done right 
now he is not a good king we we figure, we see that throughout his 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 fall from grace is seen throughout first samuel right and then of course so there is a confrontation between saul and, and samuel after the after the he quote and quote win against amalekites so he did get some victories about amonites philistines there was god's grace there but the victory on amalekite is where his downfall started in in my view right i mean i'm sure that there are other places where he went wrong but this is the sort of the pivotal moment right when a anointed king really uh, fell down the uh, fell away from grace right so he 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 doesn't kill complete amalekites he does his own thing he brings back agag one of their kings or the king of amalekite he brings back a lot of the cattle and healthy sheep and all and he does say to 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 um, to samuel that hey i brought this back so that i can give an offering to the god and samuel does say which is key here is it, it's better to obey than provide sacrifices right obedience is what god wants us to do right if we are living a life in god's way if you are looking at god for guidance if you are looking at god for all of our needs obedience is the outward expression of it right that's what really the theme right just i want to under, underscore the point here that finally of course you know we see how david is slowly coming into the picture uh, we see uh, really uh, saul um, ultimately going even to some of the mediums you know which is a big no no in, in in the sense that you know an anointed king should not be doing that finally we see saul is also jealous of david he is after his life he forces him into exile and towards the end of the uh, of samuel 1 we see how saul is dead sorry so uh, samuel is dead uh, david has spared two twice two attempts to may basically kill he had two attempts to kill saul and he has uh, let him live and then at in the the fight against the philistines it mount gilba uh, three of his sons including jonathan saul is dead So that's where we finish in First Samuel 31. That's where uh, last we discussed. So, just as an underscoring thing, it doesn't matter whether we cooperate or not. That's the last line I put there. Like people, leaders, nations could change, but God's purpose is not going to change. It's unshakable, right? So whether the 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 way we uh, whether Saul acted or whether how Eli acted, whether how david did what he did or did not do right it doesn't matter god's plans will be accomplished and i think god is still sovereign in 2021 right so whether we decide to follow the example of david and samuel and be obedient or we follow the example of saul and do our own things and bring up our own justifications god's plan will still be there whether your life will be blessed or not the outcome of your life will completely depend on that right so just going forward um in second uh, samuel uh, uh, we will be looking at uh, five themes that is really the break up of the book um so it starts off with uh, you know uh, the news that is given to david uh, about the the that the fact that philistines have actually killed so as well as his son uh, jonathan of course three more sons and lot many more um the israeli soldiers were also killed in that battle it was a blood bath essentially and this message is given by an amalekite right and there is some mystery around uh, who he is he, whether what is the real story about killing of saul because in first samuel 31 we understand that uh, he, he, saul was gravely wounded by the arrows of the philistines um and near to his death he actually does he he sort of kills himself he does suicide falls on his sword and he kills himself right he does ask his uh, armor bearer to do that for him but his armor bearer was also afraid of the fact that how somebody who is an anointed king can can be killed he he refuses to do so and and we also read that the armor bearer make sure or at least sees that the Saul is dead and then he kills himself as well right now here is amalekite 
in in the chapter right next to it right although we i think sushil mentioned this point this first samuel and second samuel is really one text in hebrew bible and then when further down conversions or at least uh, the translations that were written in greek and then of course in english and further down right um this become in two two parts so but it reads like one continuum right now i want to caution here again that even though there are some references to chronology we can't really say which happened first or second or third right i think i i, I had that struggle in within myself also to say that what happened first right but we'll look into those kind of things and of course there's a big lament from uh, 17 onwards uh, which he writes and scholars the book um, that david writes for uh, saul Uh, and uh, and Jonathan, and then we'll sort of look into that whether we have some gems out of that we can pick, and of course we'll talk about whether it is applicable in today's life or not. So with that, let's get into the first question, right? So I'm so the 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 the, the, the context is Amalekite delivers this news about death of Saul, and what's happening with um, David at that time is he has just won against the Amalekites, right? and so just to give you a quick uh, look back as well so this is where when he is returning back from philistines right philistine so the, basically he was holding up with them for a year and four months essentially um trying to escape from shaul and then through divine intervention right he was supposed to go fight against his own people israel god saved him from that right and he sort of directs him back back away from that scenario where he was then supposed to go fight against his own people coming back to ziklag where he was hold up he sees from the horizon he sees that the complete valley is burnt up his houses are uh, everything is torched his women and children are taken into captivity by amalekites so that's really when in after a year and four months the first time he is inquiring about god he asks god at that time right that what do i need to do can i go after these people who are raided their their the towns and so there he gets a victory he gets a news that his um the another enemy Saul who was after his life and who has forced him into exile for almost 15 years after the after he was anointed he gets two two of this news at least and he never was able to recover the whole of his family who were taken away by the amalekites right it's a matter of happiness isn't it finally i can go back to my own land i don't have to spend time with gentiles i can don't have to uh, uh, spend time with uncircumcised right i can go back to my own house it's definitely a good feeling so the question is but that's not what it does right i mean he is not happy he he actually writes a lament he actually um he is pained if you have read that portion you know that he is what we think would happen in a in our worldly life is completely opposite of what the reaction is giving so here when i say reaction uh you think about how he reacted to the news as well as how he reacted to the messenger which is amalekite so the question is what explains david's reaction to the news about saul's death was he justified in killing the young amalekites yeah okay so let's just explore i think uh, look everybody has um has said what what probably i need to say as well but Just let's ex- examine it a little bit more, right? So the way I am trying to do this is, we'll make some observations, we'll explore that further, and try to link it with the question, and we'll also see whether we are having some true, real in 21st century applications that we can sort of walk away with, right? So that's the way most of the, all all the questions today, you know, I'll be taking through, right? Look, David was not about 30 years old. I think there is a mention of this uh, in Second Samuel when he. Became a king, right? By some estimates, he was sort of 15, round about years when he got anointed, right? And then for the next 15 years or so, at least um, better part of one decade or more, right? Uh, he he was continuously being chased by uh, chased by um, not only by the enemies um, of Israel, but now by Saul himself, right? so i think um, some of the observations that we can pick up from here uh, from the text itself is um we we can see this uh, pattern of you know saul's kingship as well as his essentially his life coming to a slump 
essentially coming down. At the same time, we see can see a rise of David, right? So this pattern of you know Eli coming down and then of course you know Samuel coming up is also can be seen in first first uh, first Samuel, right? And so here is really where this whole comes to a point, right? Um, so we can see that um, even though both are anointed kings, but there is a Saul essentially through his actions put an expiry date for his anointment, right? We also understand that his death, physical death, is far later, right? His spiritual death has happened. I think this was also mentioned by Sushil in his classes, right? So keep that in mind, right? And then let's also see in just from the text itself, right? He's not just lamenting over Saul and Jonathan, right? There is an aspect of him lamenting over of his complete army of God, right? All the Israelites soldiers who were killed on that day. As well as fourth element is the house of Israel, right? The 12 tribes, if you may. So God is trying to sort of unite all this. And this single event has passed his plans in a way, right? And it, another way to look at it is also that for Philistines, Dagon, their God, has gotten a victory over God of Israel. So, so it's a very pivotal moment. It's a very pivotal moment. And that's really, so we cannot see it from a standpoint of, is he mourning for Jonathan or Saul? But he is looking at from the overall context. But I think somebody already mentioned this point. His eyes are on God, right? He, he as in David, understands that God's plan has been put to halt because of this, this death of both Jonathan and Saul. Right? And I think we'll read further down the line, you know, how you know how he laments about it, how what what, what qualifies, um, you know, who are the people who have been killed in this event. You know, he, he sort of gives that in his poetry, if you may. Another important thing you to keep in mind from the text itself is that the Amalekite identifies himself. This is from 1 to 16, identifies himself as a Jer or Sojourner. Jer is a Hebrew word, right? It's a foreigner in the land of, you know, among the Israelites. Just keep that in mind and we'll explore more on that. And then, of course, uh, you know, um, I think this point also came where, you know, his, his mouth itself is used to testify and say that, yes, I have killed a God's anointed king. So we'll see what is wrong with that or why is it punishable by death. We'll explore that a little bit later, right? And so one, one, one point I will mention here is this also gives an insight into how David, if you, if you want to assume this, this is essentially where Saul is dead. And in a way, even though he's not given that kingship, kingship of David is ascending or it's started. This is a pivotal moment where he's taking decisions as a king as well, right? And so, and in all doing that, he's not just saying that I'm the king, I'm going to take this decision. He is looking at God, what is pleasing to God, right? And that classic difference about, you know, Saul's decision making and David's decision making will come through here, right? Where Saul's decision making is all about what is good for me, what will exalt me versus David's outlook of what's going to make my God happy. Is this in God's right, righteous or not? Right. So that, that will sort of explore a little bit as we go forward. Right. So just a part of, part of exploration, I'm just going to explore on the first question, right? What explains David's reaction to news about Saul's death? Right. So we see a revival in David. I told you about how he was, uh, uh, you know, he was amid the Philistines for a year and four months. No reference of or of him asking about or inquiring about God, right? So right at the end of First Samuel 30 is right around about that. There is where he is first time inquires the Lord, should I go and pursue these Amalekites who destroyed my village or town or whatever Ziklag is, right? So we see just like the ark was taken from from the uh, among the Israelites. Um, and then, of course, you know, the Philistines, because of the plagues, all the tumors, everything that they suffered through because of the ark being among them, 
they sort of send it back without Israelite have to do anything. It was completely God doing his sort of uh, divine intervention, if you may, right? Literally God playing his role in the physical realm, right? The same way David has been sent back uh, without having to attack his own people, having to get into that problem of attacking Israelites itself. And then he's inquiring, he's starting to build that relationship back with God. His connection with God is getting strengthened. And you have to remember, when he when 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 the Ziklag was you know were destroyed by Amalekites, his own people, his own men tried to stone him to death. So amid that, the lowest of lowest of points in his life, spiritually, mentally, whichever way you want to think about it, he, he relies back onto God. He asks Father God to strengthen him. Right? That's the reference I've given that. That David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. So the, the spiritual revival, just keep that in mind, right? Second is, we know David is man after God's own heart, right? Who says? Acts 13, 22, God's testimony is that, not somebody else. He says, a man after my own heart. What does that signify, right? So a man who is after God's own heart understands God's heart. If you may, he reflects God's will, almost like a mirror, right? He looks at God, he understands what it is, and his manifestation in the real world is what God's will is, what makes God happy, decisions based upon whether it is righteous or not, those kind of things, right? So it's the testimony of the God himself saying that he is after his, my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do, right? So let's keep that in mind as well, right? At the end of the day, right, um, David does understand the principles. Of course, Matthew 5, 44 was written long after, I'm assuming here. But it does tell us to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us. Romans 12, 19 says, do not take revenge, my friends. Okay. So, so his, his reaction towards Saul is explained through this. He understands this basic principle, right? He understands that. And then ultimately what I wanted to say is here is David's response is not with an eye for his own glory, as I mentioned before, right? it's more for God's glory, right? God kept Saul in the place that he was in. He anointed him as the king of Israel. It is not his place. The two chances he got to kill him, he, he said no to those chances. Because he knew that it's not his place to kill Saul. God will do what he needs to do in his time. Right? So I think last thought I'm going to leave you with here is, um, you know, is if you want to compare that to what happened in the New Testament, you know, there is a portion in New Testament, which is Matthew 23, 37 to 39, where God, Jesus Christ itself is crying out for Jerusalem. And he says that people are not willing Okay, people are not willing to adhere to love him back the way he is loving them. Right? So I think um, you know there is a love that David has for Saul. So even though he is being exceptionally bad towards him, he literally you know he was after his blood. That love proceeds because his eyes are not about what displeases me. It's not about, does that make me angry? Does that make me happy because he's dead? It's all about what God wants. He sees divine providence in everything that he does because he is strengthened through God. All right, so let's let's explore the second part of the question. Was he justified in killing the young Amalekite? I think very good points came. Some of the points probably I did not think about. Uh, but let's look at who are these Amalekites, isn't it? Now, there is a lot of, I have given a few references that you can read about here, right? What does God say about the Amalekites? Okay. Exodus 17, 14 to 15 says, I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. This is not somebody said or something. God literally saying these things. Deuteronomy, they met you on a journey and cut you off. Uh, for all who are lagging behind, they have no fear of God. So if you look at him, the messenger, just as an Amalek, to me, it looks like a clear license to kill the Amalek, right? 
the, look what what has been said. So this is sort of a payback for you know if you remember the Amlek story, you know these guys were knocking off people who are falling behind when the Israelites were passing through on the journey from Egypt. Who are the people falling behind, right? You know people who are sick, who are old, children, women, and they were specifically targeting those and stopping them from getting to the promised land, literally creating problems for God's work. So he's saying to wipe them out. And that's really the instruction that was given to Saul as well, which he did not fully complete, right? It sure looks like a clear license. I hope that you are all tracking, right? Another thing is, you know, the fact that whether the, what Amalekite is saying is true or not, right? That, that, that is a lingering question about is what is happening because we just read he committed suicide. Now here it is, Amalekite is trying to say that he killed Saul. Right? So I, I'm just giving you a quick, few things to think about, right? In Chronicles, um, first Chronicles 10, 4, you know, so which hopefully was written much later than book of uh, Samuel, they're recounting this, right? And they said, therefore, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it, right? And I'm saying that that record is consistent with what happened in 1 Samuel 30, 31, 4, right? So there is, there is a, at least it smells like a fabrication. I, I'm not in a position to claim that he's lying or not, but my strong inclination, the way I read it, maybe some other references I read, it, it looks like he has made up the story to curry favor. And the fact that the only person who will get benefit out of saying that story is him, pushes it even further down the line of him fabricating that story, right? He did get the crown and the armlet of Saul that tells that there was some exchange between him and Saul. Right, but whether he killed or not is is up to uh, but what he was counting upon a human worldly reaction from David, which is not what he got. Probably very surprising to him, but let's see further down the line. So with this, I feel like there's enough example to say that yes, he was probably asking for it. Right. Let's see further down. So Amalekite, he's not simply a an Amalekite. He is the son of a sojourner, right? So sojourners are folks, and I think uh, you know the example of Ruth. Uh, even though she was not Israelite, she was a Moabite. Again, Moabites were enemies of Israelites, right? So there was a, a custom of allowing the foreigners to live among Israelites, right? So not only that he's a sojourner, he's the son of a soldier. That means the second generation. And, and I've put some examples or at least references of how does God want Israelites to treat the sojourner. One quick example would be, you shall not wrong the sojourner, a foreigner for that matter, right? Or maybe some, 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 some passages say it's just a person who is passing by, pass through person, right? Or oppress him. For you are sojourners in the land of Egypt. So that's a reference, isn't it? But when they were slaves in Egypt, those Israelites were sojourners in their land. They were foreigners. So remember that. And so don't harm no sojourners without due process. Right? So due process means what is the applicable law of the land, right? So again, one thing is there, whether David understands his line. And second aspect of it is that as a reader, what we gather, right? So please try to see whether you can keep those two aspects separate because to me, it looks like David took his word verbatim. And that's the reason why he has been killed. He killed a anointed king. And so David doled out the justice as per the Mosaic law. And in the Mosaic laws and this Sojourner, since of course Sojourner part, he, you know, he, since he is also living among the Israelites, the law applies. For capital crimes, for example, right? If you are perjuring yourself, it's punishable by death. Killing is punishable by death if the intent is there. And in those scenarios, although there was sacrificial blood that you could spill in some of the crimes, in these specific crimes, the book is clear. The, 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 the law is clear. It's punishable by death, right? Even though I'm not saying that this is the reason why it allows or justifies killing of family like it. I'm simply saying that in the background for as a reader, we are told to also understand that since he was living as a second generation sojourner in the land of Israel, 
definitely he was expected to know the law obviously he could figure out who Saul is in the battlefield he is also figuring out who david is he's directly coming to david so he has the understanding who these people are he also understands the fact that he is god's anointed people he also knows probably which is a surprising part to me probably surprising to david as well that this person knows that david uh, david left saul alone twice he did not kill him kill him even though there was a clear chance for him to become king then and there itself after knowing all that he is still accepting to the fact that and that's where the his his only motive was to curry favors i'm not sure what exactly would those favors will be but definitely he knows he is going to be the next king so he, and if i am doing a favor to the king we, we can extrapolate from there right so simply saying mosaic law does apply to a son of sojourner as well right i think the final part here I'm not going to go into great detail, but ultimately the point is that, and I think in Deuteronomy 6, 13 to 15, God also tells the you know Israelites to teach each of their children. That includes sojourner, because obviously the treatment of a sojourner is similar to a treatment of a Israelite. Even though his alignment, political alignment might be different, or maybe he doesn't want to be called as a Israeli, but still, if you are living among them, God forces them to learn the Mosaic law. This all points to a simple point that after knowing all this. Is after knowing the fa fact he did, uh, you know, uh, violate at least two of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Right? These are all um, punishable by death in the, in in case of uh, mosaic laws. Right? And 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 if you want to get a little bit more into the 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 the, the what laws bind people who are giving witnesses, right? Uh, it says that, you know, I think in Deuteronomy 19, 18 and 19, it says that, you know, the judge will make a decision, right? If somebody is saying a false witness about a brother, right? The same punishment you intended for that brother will be given to you, right? So this actually points to the fact that whenever you are in a capital crime, which is what the death of Saul is, right? These perjured, perjured moments can be taken as a violation of law, which is punishable by death. Right. So to me, this gives him whether he knew whether the Amalekite was saying the truth or not. This gives him the law by law rights and justification to kill the Amalekite. All right. Last but not the least, on this uh, one through sixteen, few things we have to keep in mind. Right. As leaders, right, the conduct we do is definitely leads to a faith for ourselves and for our houses. In both cases of Eli and Saul, we can see that not only Saul died, his children also died along with him. So if you are given the responsibility by God, if you are doing the work of God, you have to deliver that with full conviction. With your eye on the God, not on self and self-growth and all those kind of things that Saul was involved in. Trust in God's timing. David, that Period, if you talk about, you know, I think 15 years old, he was anointed to be a king. Uh, took another 30 years, uh, 15 years to get him to age 30 when he actually became the king, right? So really, you know, in those times, the only thing that David or the story of David tells us is that even though things are not moving, God is with you. If you are relying on God, God is going to be with you, whether it is time period is 15 years, 20 years, 40 years, whatever it is, right? It's, it's, it's definitely a, a theme that we should be sort of trying to try it out in our own lives in 2020 as well, right? Fourth one is true leaders show mercy, respect, and empathy for their leaders. Now, in, in, in each of their rights, right, Saul was a leader, so was David, right? He was not a king yet, but David was a leader. So it's possible that in our, in our life, if you take that scenario and say that, okay, I have a boss, right? is completely mean to me. He is just making my life miserable. What's our normal reaction? Is sympathy and mercy and empathy the reaction? Do we ever consider the fact that maybe the boss has a sick kid at home? Maybe the, my boss has a sick parent at home or maybe you know some, some other you know, unsurmountable reasons for which he has a wrong attitude. Do we take the time 
to sort of walk in their shoes and understand that they they might be in that problem right in this case david david understands the fact that saul will never get the opportunity to ask for forgiveness he never did even in the last moment of his death he was wondering whether you know you know the philistines will uh, you know do bad with my body as opposed to actually ask for forgiveness so that's a big big miss so he is sorry for saul he is really sorry for saul that even though he was anointed he never did what is required of him he missed upon the glory of god he missed upon the blessings that could have been his right so you see the dynamics of how a leader looks at another leader right so last but not the least deal with the amalekites in your lives right so if you read carefully there are several uh, passages in bible in, in as well as in samuel 1 where it clearly says that the amalekites has to be wiped out and i think in this case just giving a little bit history right amalekites come from the amalek who was a descendant of esau and really esau if you read that story about jacob and esau he he was cheated off of the birth rights so th- that's where the animosity comes from for the amaleks right so that um, animosity has been continued with the jacob who was then uh, you know uh, uh, then basically you know uh called uh, that animosity continues right but that's a representation of our carnal nature so if you remember that story right he so essentially gave away his birthright just for a pot of porridge i'm hungry i want to give my birthright away right the carnal nature right so you had to look within right so i think in galatians 5:16 to 17 says so i say to you, live by the spirit you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature for the sinful nature desire what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit is contrary to the sinful nature they are in conflict with each other so so that you do not so you do not want to do what you want sorry so that you do not do what you want it's in constant conflict so i think it's a clear indication it's a almost like a news you can use it's not done ever right i mean this this this, this cleansing is not done ever unless we completely eliminate this amalekite whoever that might be the the figurative amalekite whatever that might be whatever that sinful carnal nature of ours if you do not address that in our lives it leads to death okay with that i think uh, we'll go into the second question i know we are running short on time but we'll let's just let's try it out second question is what does david's lament specifically teach us about human behaviors when god is at the center of our lives versus god is not right so he writes a big beautiful lament it's called as the bow by some accounts it is still sung by the israelites right it is one of their pivotal remembrance of you know what happened with saul as well as how jonathan was and all that that's beautiful about that scenario uh, it's repeated right so the question is what can we learn right uh, hopefully all of you have spent some time with reading that poetry that lament uh, 17 through 27 okay so let's move into it uh, in the same uh, way the observation exploration application um you know there are a few things that i have written down i definitely will be sending it as part of the pitch that uh, you know at the end of this uh, discussion today um yeah definitely i think all the points that the people said um i i really don't have too much to sort of expand upon but i'll anyways i'll try my best right um so we see uh, david is great love he shows great love and generosity in his heart towards saul it's difficult isn't it so think about simple simply think who are those people who has wronged you right simply think are you able to do what david has done for saul are you able to write a poem for somebody who has wronged you in several different ways for forget about this somebody cuts off you on the road can you not can you stop yourself from maybe you know sticking your head out and just screaming at them right let's start there i guess right so it's a very interesting uh, thought experiment if you may if you understand how it is possible for saul to lament and write a national 
poem if you may and it was he actually made it sure that it goes into the book of jasher not part of bible but several places in bible it's almost like a lost book but he said it has to be accounted there right this poem has to be there so in a way right his ability to write a poem for a person who was after his own life tells me that not only that he did not kill him right with sword but in his heart also he is not killing him it's not like you know in in several of this uh, you know uh, this is a eulogy right it's a part of a death ceremony if you may right the, the eulogies we see like people are just like a lot of flowery words you know whether the person was whatever it is it's not that right he is not not thinking about ill in a way to Saul in in his after his death not just the fact that he did not kill him physically but also in the his heart and minds right he continues to see beauty he is comparing him with you know swift eagles and strong lions right he is uh, he is saying that don't he doesn't want that news to be spread all across Gath and Ascalon these are the extreme eastern and western cities in in Philistia, right? So these are the so essentially that means don't tell it to the entire Philistines. Don't don't give this message so that their daughters and you know they are going to make uh, you know they will be happy about it. The fact that their god might be actually be exalted as like some sort of a uh, beater of like you know god of Israel, right? So he he knows this, right? So that's why he's saying that don't 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 let this news go out, right? He's calling for the daughters of Israel, right? Look, we say a lot of bad things about Saul. He had good days. He did bring prosperity to Israel, right? And I think that's clearly in the in the lament as well, right? He did uh, allow the women of Israel to be dressed in you know uh, good clothes as well as you know ornaments, if you may, right? That that comes about, right? So there is some good there, and so he's calling all of them to sort of mourn for Saul, right? Um, he is cursing Mount Gilboa, and by some accounts, some somewhere I was reading that it's people who go to uh, Israel, they actually try to see this whether actually, you know, this mountain is really cursed and it was cursed to be barren. So there's no dew drops on it. As a matter of fact, it was cursed that it will never be part of an harvest which is meant for offerings, right? So they indeed, it seems like there is some areas in Mount Gilba where, you know, the greenery is all around, but some portion is like always not having any growth. And then it also refers to the wars of uh, weapons of war, right? And I think I was I was struggling a little bit there, but it really means about not only he's talking about just the uh, just Samuel and uh, you know, I'm sorry uh, Saul and uh, Jonathan, but the soldiers, the unknowns, right? But still the part of the God's army, right? He's lamenting for them, right? And then of course uh, you know the bigger picture. Somebody mentioned it. Sorry, I couldn't catch the name, but I also feel that this lamentation is more catered towards. His friend Jonathan. As a matter of fact, I think in the next slide I will show you, like you know, the, it's called as the bow, right? And it's more has to do with the fact that you know Jonathan is known for his archery, right? As you, as you can remember, you know the Israelites were not allowed to have iron-made weapons. As a matter of fact, they're not allowed to work on iron by the Philistines, right? And that's because you know it could be converted into an arrow or a sword or whichever is the case. And so they used to leave them. So it was. Saul and Jonathan's, you know, kingship time, right? That's really where you know they started to pick up on this uh, bow and arrow, and I think this is aptly uh, named as uh, the the lament of bow uh, because of this fact, right? So let's really look at the exploration part, which is the the question really, right? So I just have written uh, in the lighter uh, words, right? The takes direct takes from the lament, right? And so I'm just comparing what Saul is doing. Jonathan is doing what is written by, about Saul, Jonathan, and David, right? So if you see, for example, um, uh, one quick example is it says how the mighty has fallen. At least four or five times this 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 has been repeated, right? And so in this context, to me, the mighty is definitely Saul. Why? He is God's anointed king, part a big part of God's plan, humongous part of a God's plan. To, 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 to take him towards building of a country, nation under God, right? He is the mighty one. If, if he, he was set aside to do this job, right? But because of self-exaltation, because of self-deception, right? This led to loss of his kingship, as a matter of fact, his life. 
that's the so when you don't have god so look the, at this slide or this 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 this, uh, this portion from a standpoint of what is the outward expression of a person who is in the spirit who is looking up to the god for his response for guidance versus a person who is not right and it's not just always black and white isn't it saul is saul probably played with that am i am i am i okay with 95% am i okay with maybe 99% you know versus david even though flawed completely flawed but he has he is 100% repentance as well as 100% obedience right so look at it from that standpoint shield of the shawl not anointed with oil right this has to do with the fact that his spiritual death had happened long before his physical death right so what is the physical manifestation outward manifestation no repentance i don't want to repent it what i am actually worried whether the uncircumcised will defile my physical body that's my concern at the door steps of death for saul so you, you can see the picture of a person who constantly is thinking about is it going to pain me is it going to make me happy what is it going to do me versus these two other guys jonathan and david right let's look at jonathan for example right in life and in death they were not divided what does that say jonathan has a full understanding that saul is not a good king as a matter of fact saul is the person who attempted to even kill jonathan his own son through a, like, a you know a weapon at him essentially right a spear at him but he did not leave his father's side for simple reason that he also looked at god and said what's what's going to make my god happy what is in in the plan of my god my plan of my god is john saul being the anointed king he is part of this plan so i'm going to support him till the last breath of my life he did not say that jonathan is so sorry saul is so mean i'm his son you know why he's trying to do this and he's doing wrong and he's going to talk to this uh, you know the witches in andor all kinds of things which is blasphemous almost right he's not doing that he, because his his response doesn't come from the fact that what does it make him feel it, it comes from the fact that how does that line up with my lord to whom i am answerable to right your love to me was extraordinary that's the second point i have written right so this is again david saying you know his love is so extraordinary now what's the dynamics between these two person the birth right for being the next king of israel is jonathan right but still jonathan even though i understand so think about in our scenario like if we know that that a piece of land is mine it's my it's in my family and somebody has a claim on it for some, for some reason that okay somehow he's anointed how does that make you feel now here is the kingship of israel right and so he is okay with it as a matter of fact he understood what is god's plan he understood that god's plan now is for david to reign as a king let's keep moving on what about david of course you know he he shows uh, a lot of tolerance we already talked about it to towards saul it's easy to understand why he loves jonathan as a matter of fact he calls him as a brother almost elevating saul's position to be his father i would even say maybe it's me extrapolating this that allows him to add him into the eulogy as a father just because of the, the, the fact that he calls him as the brother his pain is genuine is coming from the fact that he is now understanding god's will has been altered as well as the fact that dave saul who is now given the status of his fatherhood he is dead all this tells me that he is not just making this up right he is not just putting up a show for being the next king he is not doing that he is simply doing it because he genuinely hurts his heart that the two people he loves saul and god are hurt with this so he knows the god's heart he knows that god is weeping because his plans have come to a sort of a, at least a temporary stall right and last but not the least the bow of jonathan that's this is what what i was saying right look bow is what ended the life of saul right he, so this is also a cautionary tale i think it will come in the next part that's right but really you know to understand the fact that you know be ready practice right uh, it's the lament is named as bow because of course uh, 
uh, Jonathan is good at that, right? As a matter of fact, in one of the reading on the study Bibles I was looking at, it says that the Israelites were using this as a song to be sung when they practice archery. In the in, in the remembrance of Jonathan, what Jonathan did. Right? So you see how, how the outward expression becomes completely ob obscure, weird, borderlining sin versus righteous outcomes. The thought process gets aligned. Your outcomes gets aligned. You know, you, there's a refinement in what you're doing. It's not worldly. It surely is not worldly, but it's godly, right? So that's really the point I was going to make here. Application was right. Saul definitely is a picture of a man who was who was ruled by his flesh, and he disobeyed God, and that killed him. So this is the question I wanted to you know this is not really a question but a question in question if you may, right? You know how often do we say to ourselves, "I am content, I am good, I do a little bit of church, um, I can't be." 100% Christian. I'm 95%. I'm happy with that. I can't be a person, right? So probably Saul thought the same, isn't it? The victory over Amalekite, which is a to God, it was not a full victory. To him, it was a full victory. He probably would have thought to himself, God must not be too upset. How else will I get this victory? Are we in that place? Do we do that? Something to ponder upon. David does reference to the bow. Is call for us to learn from our past. What is the past in the, in that scenario? That Saul, the anointed king, was at least gravely wounded with the the archers of Amalekites. Uh, sorry, with the Philistines. Learn, right? So here is more on the spiritual level. Right? I think in Ephesians six twelve says, "For the struggle is not against flesh, but with whom? Forces of evil in heavenly realms." Right? Peter one five eight says. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This is a caution, right? Be ready, be ready with this fight, which is constant, right? Don't, 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 don't just say that I'm 95% Christian, I'm, I'm fine with it, right? I mean, see where that 5% would come from. Why is that 5% not there, right? That that's necessary. And last but not the, not the least, right? Whatever preparations you do, you can be a good archer, you can have good chariots. In Proverbs 21, 31, it says, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory rests with the Lord. So all victories, all the way from Moses down to you know this stage of David, every time there is a prayer or a asking of the Lord that precedes any kind of victory. Whenever that has not happened, there's no victory. You can have a victory in your mind, like, like Saul did. He thought he won against Amalekites, but that victory will le lead you to a cruel death at some point. So the true victory always proceeds with a praise or at least asking for directions or asking for the Lord or inquisitiveness about the Lord, and then it turns into a victory. So those are the things I think you know still applicable in our lives, right? Last but not the least, I'm not sure if there is a time for a breakout session. Um, you can do a time check, uh, uh, Manu yeah. here. Rajiv, I think uh, we are short on time. Manu? Okay. Yeah, we can skip today, the breakout. Okay. Uh, do you have any final I mean, thoughts you want to yes. share? Yes. So, um, so maybe the breakout question is something too we can uh, look from our side, right? Like David, this chapter started off with David getting a message. A uh, horrible message, as a matter of fact, right? That 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 the king of Israel is no more. It has, I think, Sushil talked about implications to different people at that time in in his last um, class, right? So, what is our reaction, right, when we get bad news or unfavorable news? If if our uh, re knee jerk reaction is insecurity, fear, or anxiety, not to say that's wrong. But that's definitely not righteous. That's not what is expected of us. If you have a belief system, a trust in Lord, looking to Lord, then you have to examine, self-examine and understand why does that happen when the news which is not favorable to you comes and then you, know, you get into that mindset where you're all disturbed. Whichever is the 
qualifying word you want to use you know that happens to you so that's really the point i want to say final words is you know continue looking at what david is david does i think he is the most prolific character which has been mentioned several times <clears throat> in 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 the bible i think right after jesus christ clearly god wants us to learn something from him in new testament itself almost 59 times his name is coming 66 chapters dedicated to david's life to me that means that definitely there is treasure trove of things that we can use in our own growth and spirituality and i, I wish that as we continue in second samuel uh, we'll explore some of those gems thank you